Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today's the 8th of November of 2020. Well, actually about to be the 9th. But I'm going to be talking about the ROX index. And when I say ROX, it's R-O-X. And what this index does is predict who is going to fly or who isn't going to fly on high flow nasal cannula. And I will say that you should definitely check out the show notes and the citations as most of the articles used as a reference to this are free and that you should not trust me. Read the data for yourself. For those of us who've worked in the ER, the ICU, or a step-down unit, we all have had this patient. You know, someone who's an acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. Let's just call it pneumonia of some sort, maybe even ARDS. And you have them on a regular nasal cannula or a venting mask, and they just don't cut it. So when you put them on high-flow nasal cannula to try to bring up their SATs, as well as decrease their work of breathing. Now, when we have people on the ventilator or people on non-invasive ventilation, which a lot of people call BiPAP, you usually have a screen that's telling you what tidal volumes these people are taking, what the respiratory rate is, minute ventilation, et cetera, et cetera, which all make us feel warm and fuzzy inside because we know what this information is. But when you have somebody on high flow nasal cannula, where what you do is just titrate the FiO2 as well as the flow, You don't have a monitor to give us all this information when we are ultimately just data obsessed people that we like to know the numbers of it. So what does this leave us with? Do we have some sort of metric that we could use or some sort of calculation that we could use to predict the patient is going to do well or they're not gonna do very well and they're possibly gonna crash and they need to be intubated? Well, this is where the ROCKS index comes into play. Before we get into talking about the ROCKS index, let's talk about why we should reach for high flow nasal cannula first in patients who have pneumonia and even ARDS. In 2017, in the New England Journal of Medicine, Fratt and his buddies published in, like I said before, the New England Journal of Medicine, the Florali trial, which is, if you want to Google it, first of all, it's in the show notes, so you can check it out there, but it's spelled F-L-O-R-A-L-I where what they did is randomize over 300 patients who were in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure to receive one of three modalities to oxygenate them, either non-invasive ventilation, which is either BiPAP or CPAP in the terms that you and I know about, conventional oxygen therapy, whether it be a non-rebreather, venti mask, or high-flow nasal cannula. And in this study, they found that patients with a PF ratio of less than 200 did better on high-flow as opposed to non-invasive ventilation or conventional oxygen therapy. Now, for the sake of those of you who just said, what in the world is PF ratio? Well, I'm going to explain that to you, but it's a way to categorize the severity of ARDS. And the, the equation for PF ratio is PaO2 over FiO2. Obviously, you would get the PaO2 from an ABG and you get the FiO2 from the oxygenation device that you're using to provide oxygen to your patient. And so this whole obsession about PF ratios came about, I think it was 2012, because I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, per the ARDS definition task force, because they tried to standardize how we would go ahead and define ARDS based on the PF ratio. And so for those of you who are taking notes, there are three different types, mild, moderate, and severe ARDS. And a lot of us use this to document in our notes every day how severe the patient's ARDS is. And so for people who have mild ARDS, for example, their PF ratio is less than or equal to 300 all the way down to 200. For those who are moderate, it's between 100 and 200. And for severe, these are the sick, sick people, the PF ratio is less than or equal to 100. Okay, so, and and just for a a bonus tip here, the PROCEVA trial, which was the trial where they actually proned people on mechanical ventilation to show an improvement in mortality in ARDS, they used a PF ratio of less than or equal to 150, if I remember correctly. Now, people often stumble when entering these numbers into the calculator for PF ratio. Remember, use the decimal point for the FiO2. What I mean by that is let's say, for example, that the patient's PF, their, the patient's uh, PaO2 is 100 on 40% FiO2. That means that when you plug it into your calculator, you're going to go 100 divided by 0.4, and that's going to give you a PF ratio of 250. That means that the patient is going to fit into the mild category of ARDS.
All right, so now that we got the Berlin criteria out of the way, let's finish up talking about the Florali trial, which, as I mentioned before, and it's cited in the bibliography to this podcast. So let's talk about what the ROCKS index is. First of all, what does ROCKS stand for? They showed in that study that patients who had a PF ratio of less than 200 were associated with having, first of all, a lower mortality, which is great because we don't want our patients to die. They also had more ventilator-free days, and they also had a lower risk of intubation. And again, most of these patients had pneumonia. Now, there is a downside to waiting too long to pull the trigger and intubate your patients, which is why the ROX index was designed to help us determine whether the patient is safe or they should be intubated. Because again, at the end of the day, we can't forget about all the different complications that we could have when we put somebody on mechanical ventilation, first from the intubation itself, as well as the prolonged run at time on the ventilator. So it's defined as the ratio of oxygen saturation as measured by the pulse ox, which ultimately is the SpO2, divided by the FiO2 to the respiratory rate. So one of the things that people often do, um, and I'm not trying to you know, throw shade on my nursing colleagues or respiratory therapy colleagues, but a lot of people just go ahead and document 18 or 20 into everybody's chart with regards to the respiratory rate. And you know what the saying is with, with regards to chicken poop. You know, you can't put in chicken poop and expect to get out chicken soup. And obviously poop is uh, the PG version of what usually is said in that saying. But to, actu- to accu- accurately, I can't speak today, to accurately obtain this number of the respiratory rate, one of the things that I do is actually get up and observe the patient breathing for a minute and count the respirations. Now, I know you might think I'm a little bit weird or creepy, creepy, although I am, but sometimes I just watch the patients breathe without being noticed through the window, from the door, or inside the room to count the respiratory rate. Like all equations, the validity depends on the numbers you put into it. So that's that. So where did the ROCKS index come from, many of you ask, because many of you have not heard it and it's the year 2000. Well, this concept was has actually been around in the literature since 2016, where Roca, who's a Spanish uh, intensivist, published a four-year, again, and I say Spanish because he's from Spain, not because he speaks Spanish, but Roca published a four-year prospective observational two-center cohort study of 157 patients. And I got to tip my hat to this guy and his team because this took four years to do. And for the sake of maintaining your attention, they found that the rocks of greater than or equal to 4.88 at 12 hours if it's greater than or equal to 4.88, the patient was safe from needing to be intubated. Again, it's not 100%, but it's quite good. The fine details of this paper can be accessed in the actual paper. If I read you the paper, you're definitely going to change to a more entertaining podcast than what I'm saying right now. And then there are some other goodies that could be teased out of the paper, which include the median duration of those who did well on high flow was about three days. And for those who didn't do well, only lasted about a day. And they did find that the patients who were intubated after 48 hours of being on high flow did not ultimately have a worse prognosis. So in this particular study, delaying intubation did not lead to worsening outcomes. So I know what a lot of you are thinking right now. You guys are good, nice skeptics, just like I am. You're asking yourself, is one study enough to prove the functionality of the ROCKS index? Well, To go ahead and prove that it works, Roca and his team went at it again in 2019, and they published in the Blue Journal, which is the, which I, what I believe is the highest impact factor journal in critical care medicine, a validation study, and further delineated other parameters for ROCKS index. And so, using that greater than or greater than or equal to 4.88 as a ROCK score at 12 hours, meaning that you are in the safe zone. They went ahead and and were able to prove that at 2 hours, 6 hours, and 12 hours, if your ROCKS index is greater than or equal to 4.88, you are in the clear. Again, it's not 100%, guys, but it's it's pretty good at predicting high flow nasal cannula success. But what about predicting failure of high flow nasal cannula? Because you want to know who you could intubate or who you need to intubate. So what they found was that a ROCKS score of less than 2.85 at two hours predicts high flow nasal cannula failure. So if you're somebody who's in the emergency department and you know your patients are gonna sit there for let's say two hours or perhaps even more, 
using a rocks calculating the rock score and finding it to be less than 2.85 is going to avoid the critical care people coming down, seeing the patient, and then having to immediately intubate them. So you might save yourself some face on that. Then at six hours, if the rock score is less than 3.47, then that patient is likely not going to do well. And if at 12 hours it's less than 3.85, that patient is not going to do well. So ultimately, if it's less than these different numbers, intubation is likely going to be the correct way to go for these patients. And so I'll repeat it again. At two hours, it's less than 2.85. At six hours, it's less than 3.47. And at 12 hours, it's less than 3.85. Now, you might be asking yourself, is there a nice flow chart somewhere with the ROCKS index to help us better manage these patients? Well, yeah, there is, but obviously I can't show you pictures over a podcast. And, and ultimately it's a copyrighted uh, image, so I can't show it on my website or on the show notes directly. But if you go ahead and click on the show notes, I will have a link directly to that paper where it lives. And as a bonus, that paper also includes an algorithm on when to use high flow or non-invasive ventilation for pre-oxygenation for intubation. Well, I would like to say right now that this data is not validated in COVID-19 patients, but it is validated in pneumonia patients. Again, it's, it's a pretty different pathology at the end of the day for those of us who are quite familiar with taking care of patients with COVID. So let's look at some examples really quick. Let's say, for example, you have a patient who has SATs of 95% on 100% FiO2, and they're breathing 18 times a minute. This patient has a ROC score of 5.28, which means they're pretty much in the clear. But let's go ahead and change some numbers around. Let's say, for example, that that same patient has SATs of 95%, again, on 100% FiO2, but they're breathing instead of 18 times a minute, they're breathing 25 times a minute. That gives them a rock score of 3.8. So at 12 hours, that's showing that it's not going to be very good for the patient's outcomes if you just continue them being on high flow nasal cannula. That patient likely needs to be intubated. Now let's say, for example, that that patient is somebody who's in the ER and their stats again are 95% on 100% FiO2, but instead of breathing 20-something times a minute, they're breathing 35 times a minute. So they're huffing and puffing. That gives them a ROCKS index of 2.71. No matter how you look at it, that patient is not going to do well on high flow nasal cannula, and they are going to need to be intubated. So there's some real-world examples of how you can predict failure in patients who are on high flow nasal cannula. To finish things off, ultimately, I hope that this is another helpful tool to help us take care of our critically ill patients who are in hypoxemic respiratory failure. As I mentioned before, intubation is by no means benign, and neither is the whole process of mechanical ventilation. We should try to safely avoid intubating patients who do not need to be intubated by using technologies such as non-invasive ventilation and high flow nasal cannula. Now, I do have to mention this disclosure that I am a consultant, even though this is not a CME course or anything like that, but I am a consultant for a company who makes high flow nasal cannula devices, but I'm in no way being compensated by them for this post. Ultimately, this is a lot of it's my opinion, but it's all based on um, evidence that's all linked in the show notes, and I encourage you to read them for yourself and not trust me. Thank you very much for your support, and I hope you all have a great, great day.